welcome to another episode of Access Ability. It's a show on YouTube where I talk about the video game industry, accessibility and representation. Basically, how can we help more people to play games and more people to see themselves in the games they play? When I mention epilepsy in video games, I imagine a lot of you already have an idea in your mind of what that means. You're probably picturing flashing lights, someone having a seizure, that's the whole picture. That is the entirety of epilepsy in video games. And that's a part of it, but that is far from the whole picture of what epilepsy as a condition is and how it impacts video games. As it turns out, there are a lot of misconceptions in the gaming industry as to what epilepsy is, what triggers it, and what can be done to help people who have the condition to play more games more safely. So today, we're going to talk about epilepsy. We're going to talk about what it is, what it isn't, some of the things that can trigger it, and why if you're a game developer, you should never put a setting in your settings menu that describes your game as epilepsy safe. Before we get started, I want to give a special shout out to Indie Gamer Chick on Twitter, a gamer with epilepsy who took some time to help educate me on epilepsy as a condition before I started to tackle this video. She definitely helped me to dispel some of my own misunderstandings, so you should definitely give her a follow at Indie Gamer Chick on Twitter. So, what actually is epilepsy? Well, it's a condition where a person is prone to having seizures, which can manifest in a couple of ways. You might picture someone having a seizure, moving around erratically and falling to the floor, but seizures can take other forms, some of which are much less pronounced to the outside world. A seizure might, for example, have someone walking around with a vacant stare, confused and unable to process their surroundings. Seizures don't always take the form that you've been conditioned to think of. To get diagnosed with epilepsy, a person person generally needs to have had repeated seizures. A one-off seizure might not be a sign of epilepsy. Additionally, epilepsy is kind of a rare condition in that you can have either genetic or environmental causes. Some people are born with epilepsy, while some people develop it later in life or after a head injury. Some people have epilepsy as a child, but eventually stop having seizures as they grow older. However, one important thing to know about epilepsy up front is that most people with the condition don't have the type where their seizures are triggered by flashing lights the way you might default to thinking about. While only 1% of the general population has some form of epilepsy, only 3% of those people have photosensitive epilepsy. For the other 97%, other triggers are involved in their seizures. The kinds of triggers involved in epilepsy are wildly varied and not easily summed up. For some players it might be triggered by eye strain, for some it might be caused by gaming while tired, for some the trigger might be stress, for some the trigger might be loud or intensely changing sounds, for some the trigger might be overexertion and too much exercise. While it's easy to picture epilepsy only impacting games with very clear strobing flashing lights, a motion controlled game that pushes you to move around intensely could just as easily be a trigger for someone's seizures. However, because photosensitive epilepsy is perhaps the best suited to developers fixing issues with software level fixes, that's the one we're going to focus on for the rest of this episode. Another myth that frequently pops up around epilepsy is that only people who have photosensitive seizures are at all photosensitive. That is simply not the case. Everyone in the world has some degree of photosensitivity. If you were subjected to a strong enough strobing effect for a long enough period of time, your brain would start to struggle with the sensory input. For people with photosensitive epilepsy, the threshold for what will cause issues is simply lower than the general population. It's all on a curve. I might get a headache if I look at a strobing light for too long, whereas someone else may have a stronger reaction to a shorter burst of that same stimuli. Additionally, even within those who have photosensitive epilepsy, the triggers can vary wildly as to what sets off triggers. Around 40% of those impacted are set off by screen-wide white strobes, or screens where so many smaller effects are happening that it almost becomes full screen strobes. But photosensitive triggers can vary in numerous ways, and a lot of unpredictable ways. Anything from the speed at which colours change, to the colours being changed between, to a player's distance from the TV at the time of a bright flash, can potentially play into seizures being triggered. For some it's moving patterns, for some it's gradually shifting colours, there's literally too many specific triggers to ever hope to explain them all here. The reason I bring all of this up is that I 
want to make something really clear to future game developers who want to make games safer for players with epilepsy. There are certainly things you can do to make games safer. You can have settings that tone down visual effects, turn off strobe effects, reduce the amount of flashing when an attack connects or points are scored, but you need to be really careful not to label those settings as an epilepsy safe mode. Why? Well, because as said earlier in this video, there are so many varied triggers for epileptic seizures, even just focusing on photosensitivity, that there is basically no way to know for certain that you have made your game 100% perfectly safe for every photosensitive gamer with epilepsy. You can do things that you know will help a lot, reducing full screen strobe effects, reducing shifting colours, and reducing moving patterns will make your game safer for around 55% of photosensitive epileptic gamers, but you're never going to make a game you can promise players is 100% safe. That is not a guarantee you are in a position to make as a developer. So what should you call a mode that aims to help photosensitive gamers? Well, Indie Gamer Chick advocates for the term effects intensity. It describes what most games are likely to be actually changing without making any promises about the end result. Gaming will always be a risk for gamers with photosensitive epilepsy, but knowing they can turn down the intensity of visual effects can let them know the game might be on the safer end of their options. It's still a risk, but it informs them what level of risk they are taking. Even better, if you can explain to players exactly what kind of visual effects you are reducing and what is now in their place, that gives players information on exactly what was there and what replaced it. The more information you can give, the more informed a choice someone can make about whether they will try and play your game. Additionally, Indie Gamer Chick recommends that developers who do put these kinds of modes into games should still put a warning with them, warning players to consult their doctor still before playing any game. Don't assume a game is safe just because it has attempted to reduce photosensitivity triggers. Don't let the presence of these settings imply that a game is guaranteed to be safe. It would be great going forwards to see more video game developers put more effort into settings that could help reduce the visual input for players with photosensitive epilepsy, even if they need to be really careful about how they market those modes in their option settings. The important thing is that developers need to not oversell how safe their modes are, even if they were made with the explicit intent of trying to help those players. Now, photosensitive epilepsy does only impact a very small percentage of the global population, but if you stop thinking of them as a percentage, that small percentage is still thousands and thousands and thousands of people who struggle to play games who we could be making an effort to make games more accessible for. However, if developers need more reason, if that's not enough reason for them to put the effort in, as we said before, a huge percentage of the world's population does have some form of photosensitivity, and sure, it might not cause triggers, but there's players all around the world who get dizzy, who get nauseous, who get headaches from the same photosensitive effects that you would be reducing to try and help the population with photosensitive epilepsy. Dialing back the visual intensity of some of those visual cues, some of those visual strobing effects or light changing effects, can help a really wide number of people to feel more comfortable while playing, as well as, very importantly, making it safer and safer little by little for people with photosensitive epilepsy to play a wide variety of games. We need to improve support for epileptic gamers. We just need to be really, really careful about how we label that support.